gentlemen to the Adventures in History Land YouTube channel. Yay, lovely to see you all. Today I am joined by the the amazing Leslie Downer, who is the author of such books as The Last Concubine, The Shogun's Queen, Madame Sadayako, and the ultimate book, I think, on Geisha. She is uh, I've been a fan of yours for a very long time. You actually, I mean, you actually said, when I gave you an email out of the blue saying, I've written this book about the British in Japan, mm. you actually said, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll read that. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's a very brave woman as well. Leslie, it's so nice to talk to you today. Thank you. And um, thank you very much for having me on your podcast. I'm much honored. Uh, it is uh, absolutely delightful to me that people that people want to come on and talk to me about uh, about history. <laughs> so it's a two way street there. Uh, the mutual mutual honor society might be a very Japanese thing. I don't know. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> but today, as you might have guessed from the the weight of Japanese subjects I just mentioned that are included in Leslie's books. We are talking about Japanese history today, and specifically, Leslie, do you want to let people know what exciting part of Japanese history we're going to be sort of digging into? Okay, um, so we're going to be looking at the Edo period, which is between 1603, very, very precise, and uh, 1868. Um, which is the pre-modern period, a truly wonderful and fascinating period when Japan was pretty much cut off from the rest of the world for 250 years, um, which was a time of unbelievable um, cultural growth in Japan. A really magnificent culture was developed without any fuss from outside, without uh, outsiders stepping in to create unnecessary influence uh, to interfere. So we have for example, the works of Hokusai, um, the wonderful woodblock prints, magnificent woodblock prints, um, fantastic literature um, of people like Basho, the haiku poet, Sai Kaku, who wrote um, very funny novels. Um, and then Chikamatsu Monzaimon, who was the author of the Kabuki plays. So there's also probably more, actually not probably, but definitely more bookshops and more libraries in Japan than in the West. Um, people were more literate than people in the West. Also, post traveled faster than in the West. Lots of things were much better than in the West. So people sometimes say, oh, Japan was closed to outside influence as if it was stuck in some sort of time warp. It wasn't, it was developing by itself in its own way. Um, and part of this culture was the culture of the Yoshiwara, which I'm hoping to talk about, which is the women's culture. Um, part of the women's culture. There was a sort of multi-layered women's culture from a multi-class women's culture from mm -hmm. the Yoshiwara, which was the sort of courtesan city at the, if you like at the bottom of the heap, it was very complex this. Mm -hmm. And then there was ordinary women's lives. And then there was also the life of the women of the upper classes. So I think what we're gonna look at is the life of women in Edo period Japan, looking at all these different layers. Yes, I'm very excited about it. This is an excellent format here we have got for ourselves. <laughs> and yes, I think you're absolutely right about the Edo period. And by the way, you have some excellent fans behind you and some wonderful, uh, some wonderful things behind you, by the way. Your backdrop is much better than my wall. <laughs> <laughs> I put those fans up specially, actually. Um, I, would, I, should try, I should try and get some or something and put them on the wall as well. <laughs> I think they might be no fans. The bottom one is a no fan. All right. Uh, one above it might, I don't quite know what they are. They're not geisha fans, Jay. Geisha fans are smaller. Mm -hmm. But anyway, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh, me being jealous of everybody's backgrounds aside, okay, when foreigners came to Japan, they would often write books. Yep. And I read quite a lot of them. And they were always fascinated with daily life in Japanese towns and the countryside. Now, obviously, their access to these places was limited by the firstly, because they weren't really allowed to interact with people at first. And second, because they didn't really know anything about the culture they were dealing with. And one of the things that uh, is a, they always tried to explain, obviously, was the, the, the status and daily lives of women 
mm -hmm. in Japan. And this is where this is the segue into what we're going to talk about today. And those three levels mm -hmm. of uh, Japanese female society, uh, if that's the right term, that you are the expert in here. So do please do please guide guide us on and okay. and let's get uh, where do you want to start? Okay, um, I thought I'd start by thinking about the options available to women in pre-modern Japan. Mm -hmm. What were the options? Um, and the answer is that there weren't many options the, because your fate was decided by your family. But to extend that, that applied to everybody. It didn't just apply to women. It applied to everybody. You didn't, you, you, you didn't think, gee, what shall I do when I grow up? What shall I be when I grow up? You just, you, you were told you're going to do this. Now, if you were a woman, what became of you what your family decided was best for you uh, depended on what on your on your um, on your class and also on the wealth of your family. So we could start. Let's start at the top. Um, if you were the daughter of a daimyo family and one of the warlord families, um, the options would be probably the top option would be marriage. So the top top option might be marriage to the shogun. Though that was usually imperial princesses from Kyoto that did that. Second option would be to become one of the shogun's concubines. Uh, third option would be to become one of the maids in the shogun's um, ooku, which was, as it were, his harem. There were 3,000 women who lived there. Um, and the only person that could enter, that could go through the wall that separated the inner, the outer, and middle palaces from the inner palace there was had one door in it and through that door only the shogun could go so he was the only man that ever entered the women's palace um and as i said there were 3000 women living there that didn't mind mean that they were 3000 concubines there was a whole bureaucracy of women there was a whole staff of women who lived there um and there's actually a, a drawing a painting of one um done by the artist yoshitoshi which shows the kind of pretty wise, pretty smart, bemused look of a woman of the shogun's um, harem. Can you see this? Yes, lovely. Yeah, uh, with, of course, as you'll notice, her teeth painted black, um, all, mm -hmm. all um, women, uh, who all adult women have their teeth painted black. So she would have had her teeth painted black. And um, then there were, then you could, the next level down would be, you could become the wife or concubine um, of one of the daimyo warlords or one of the top samurai. I just finished reading the biography, the autobiography rather, of a woman who was the concubine of the, the uh, most powerful man in the reign of the fifth shogun. And the most powerful man's name was Yoshiyasu, um, and he was the favorite of the fifth shogun. Um, she was one of his, she was his second concubine. He kept, a, as the concubines got a bit older, he accrued a new concubine. They all lived together in one big happy family. He produced children by each of them. And just to give you some idea of how this sort of occupation was seen, whether you were the wife or the concubine, the wife had probably a slightly more honored position, but any of your children could be the chosen heir. And people said that Yoshiyasa was doing a really great thing by having lots of children by lots of women. Because the key thing, they said, it's, you know, power comes and goes, money comes and goes, but the key way to ensure your future is children. So she was, she, this woman who wrote this book was an aristocratic princess from Kyoto, um, who came down to Edo to marry this guy. So there's nothing demeaning about being a concubine. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And she also, she also, um, I was very interested to read this book. Um, she, she, was not she was not unfree i mean she she didn't consider herself not to be free of course she didn't go visit the slums downtown because she didn't want to visit the slums downtown and when she went out she went out with a group of retainers because she was a great lady she had a whole staff that went with her and when she did go out she went in a palanquin she probably went somewhere like to visit other great houses or she a few times visited the shogun's castle and the lady, ladies from the Shogun's castle, they were equally not unfree. They, they came to visit her and they went for lovely walks in her Lord's Garden, which is the uh, Rikugien in the north of Tokyo now. Um, so nobody felt that they couldn't do stuff, but there were parameters of what you did. 
Mm-hmm. You, if you were going to do something, you probably, you know, made a date for it. You and you would would go with a retinue, and your host would be expecting you, and there would be a huge and glorious party. There'd be entertainment. There'd be dancing. There'd be theatre. So, and you could also go to the Kabuki Theatre. Um, again, with your retinue. So it, it was a it was a pretty good life. I mean, somehow, you know, again, Westerners write about it and say, oh, dear, you know, a, a gilded cage. Uh, but I don't think you would have wanted to get out. Why would you want to get out? It was fine. It was fine. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that's a fair point. Um, oh, there is yeah. with, with, within the within the construct of the gilded cage. It, it it rather depends on on your definition of uh, of well well yeah how, how troubled are you by the concept really as as a person and as a, in in terms of how you've been brought up and and such like that and this is a this is a good life absolutely and it's very interesting what you said about um, about the freedoms that people assume are not there. It's, if you think about Princess Diana mm. or any of those people, I mean, before or Catherine um, or Meghan, before they married, they were normal people like us and could go shopping. Though they probably only went to Harrods, let's face yeah. it. Um, but so already what you can do in our society is limited by what sort of person you are. Mm-hmm. And then once you become once you reach this privileged position, I mean, the poor old queen you know, can't go shopping in Columbia Flower Market Mm -hmm. because she can't. Or if she did, she'd go with a retinue. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. It's not different. So in that case, she is in a gilded cage, but we don't feel sorry for her. We think she's we think she's rich and she is rich. Um, And she and by all accounts, and she she rather believes that I was blessed to be in this position where I am completely secure and I can I have I have far more than m- most of other people yeah. and therefore this is the price in a way that the lack of the lack of in quotes freedom is yeah. is is the price you pay for being blessed in another way essentially there was a um one of the women from the shogun's um harem if you like um of the um i forget which shogun it was now sixth or seventh anyway she was called ejima this is a very famous story. And she went to the Kabuki Theatre, along, of course, with her retinue. And acting there was a bloke, I've forgotten his name, but he was staggeringly good looking. And she sort of saw him, lusted after him. Um, she was not a concubine. She was a, one of the kind of people that ran the women's palace. And she was probably a virgin. She probably had no opportunity at any point to, to be with a man. And she saw this guy and she actually set up a meeting with him uh, in a tea house. And then another meeting, then another meeting, then another meeting. She got totally hooked on this guy. And she would go, in those days, Edo, of course, as you know, was a city of canals. So she'd go by boat. She'd get off at this tea house. She'd see him. She'd have a, or probably she had a bit of a, an escort who'd be around the outside, rather like when Prince Charles would meet up with a girlfriend, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and eventually they got into huge trouble about this. Um, and he, there is actually a, a great, a very dramatic TV um, series in Japan called Oku, which tells this story. Um, and in this, in their version, he got crucified. But in real life, alas, he didn't get crucified. He got exiled. Um, and she, I forget what happened to her, but she was she was disgraced. I think she had to she had to exit the palace dressed in white robes, which is through that there's one gate in the imperial palace in Tokyo, which was Edo Castle, and this was for criminals leaving. And she had to exit through that gate dressed in white. And she, of course, never saw him again. Um, but it was probably worth it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it could have been, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's an example of someone that actually mm-hmm. wished to break free of the situation. Mm-hmm. Maybe, like again, like Princess Diana having affairs or something. Perhaps so. I mean, when you're dealing with a, a group of people that size, you're bound to, to find uh, there a few of them who don't quite uh, accept the, the life, the lot they've been given. Mm-hmm. So moving on. Yeah. To- ordinary women Mm -hmm. um so that kind of yeah basically again you didn't have any choice in the matter and uh, i knew people even in the 1970s late 70s when i was first in japan who had arranged marriages people may do now i think more people started having arranged marriages in japan because it's much easier and it's much better 
your parents choose the suitable person as opposed to you falling head over heels with some some terribly unsuitable person. To be honest um, with you, I, 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 to be honest with you, I have no problem with the concept whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody twisted. Nobody was. Nobody twisted anybody's arm. They just. Mm-hmm. It was an introduction. Yeah. Um, so if you were an ordinary woman, that your parents would set you up in a marriage. You would. You if you were lucky, you'd meet this guy once before you married him. Um, somebody I knew in Gifu City in 1978, she was an old lady admittedly, but she told me that the first time that she, when, when she met her husband before they got married, she only saw his shoes because she was so shy. She didn't dare look in his face. And so she first saw his face on the day of their wedding, on their wedding day. But they had mm-hmm. been totally happily married for 50 years or something, so it was all fine. So you, could, you would have that kind of a marriage. Um, now, for the wife, that was it. Um, but for the husband, the concept was um, you do not you do not enjoy the function of sex within marriage is to make children. It's procreational sex. And you're not supposed to have a good time doing it with your wife because it's, it's sort of that's not the point. And there are professionals with whom you have a good time. So if you are a chap, mm-hmm. um, you would you would assume, depending on your income, if you could afford it, of course you'd have your wife who would be honored throughout your whole life. She would be the mistress of your house. Any concubines you had would be subservient to her. They'd be lower down the scale to her. Any concubines who had children, um, if your wife didn't have children, you know, the children might be given to the wife to, be, to bring up. Um, or if you happen to know a family that had no children and one of your concubines had a child, you might take that child, give it to the family that had no children. Um, so you had the con- so the man has his wife as many concubines as he can afford, um, and he is also free to go to the pleasure quarters and to see courtesans. And these are professional ladies who know what they're doing, and that's where you have recreational sex. So that was that doesn't mean a man's life is actually more fun. It wasn't necessarily more fun, but that was what men did, and that was what women did. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. And, uh, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, because and it's not unusual either within Japanese families in the Edo period to for the, the concept of uh, um, adopting children to other families, essentially. It was actually a... Uh, yes. Still goes on. Yeah, it was, it, in fact, it was a very large part of almost diplomacy, like everyday diplomacy sort of family ties created not only through marriage, but because one of your sons became the son of another family. and. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, I mentioned him yesterday. It, this this happened to uh, Inaski, didn't it? And oh, Inaski, yeah. I, I Inaski, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. Um, he didn't get adopted by anybody, um, and he was going to become a monk. He said at one point, and then it just so happened that he 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 hung around long enough that the heir to his original <laughs> family died, and he became. The daimyo, but also Yoshinobu, the the, the last hmm. shogun. He was adopted into the Tonkawa. Yes, indeed. Yeah. People were, I mean, people were adopted a lot, and they you could be an, you could be adopted as an adult. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So it was a whole different, and also as a man, you could be adopted because the family only had daughters, and then you would take on the family's surname, and mm-hmm. therefore you would continue that family line. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Let's go, let's go to the Yoshiwara. Let's go to of the Of course, let's go there. That sounds like an interesting place. <laughs> um, so that's where, that was one of the pleasure quarters where you could go and have fun. There were quite a lot of pleasure quarters. And at this point, I think I'm going to bring up my pictures. What about Good that? idea. There we go. Good. Right. Um, so I'm going to, I'd like to sort of tell you a little bit about the pleasure quarters and how they work. And we, mm-hmm. to start off, this is a picture of a Tayu. Right. This is a woman, I actually met this woman in Kyoto. Um, and the whole pleasure quarter culture began in Kyoto in around, oh, I think the late 1580s. There mm-hmm. were loads and loads of prostitutes and courtesans all over the place. Um, now there was no problem with morality. Forget about the whole Christian thing about morality and all that, but it was disorderly. Mm-hmm. And also, um, the shogun hoped that these people might pay some taxes. So the idea of this man called Saburo Monhara was to gather these people together into one place where you could keep an eye on them and keep an eye on all the rough elements that went there. Um, so these became small cities of women. 
um, and the men went there as visitors. This is these men who already have wives and concubines, but they're out for, to have a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. And there a whole class system developed um, with the lower ranks of prostitutes and bottom ranks who are called, I forget, they call something like ducks or something like that. And then you climb up the ranks and up at the top, you have the tayu. And the point was that these women were incredibly accomplished and incredibly beautiful. Um, and because they worked on the principle of value added, they didn't sleep with, with everybody. In fact, some of them didn't sleep with anybody, which made them all the more desirable. So this lady is somebody dressed in the costume and playing the role of a tayu, mm -hmm. um, who existed in Kyoto in the Shimabara, uh, Shimabara period. And mm -hmm. she has, this is entirely different from a geisha. It's nothing okay. to do with geisha, forget geisha. Okay. So she has this enormously heavy headdress. Can you see my pointer? She has this yes, heavy, okay. heavy headdress, um, which weighs all but five or six or seven kilos. Um, and then she has this beautiful kimono. She's playing a koku which is an ancient musical instrument played with a loose bow, which makes a really extraordinary kind of haunting sound. Mm -hmm. um, and this here is her obi. And the crucial yes. thing is the obi is tied at the front. And the meaning mm -hmm. oh, of that, yeah, yeah e most obis are tied at the back. Obis mm -hmm. are always tied at the back, except in the case of these top courtesans. Theirs are tied at the front. And the message of that is, if you are persistent enough and rich enough, and handsome enough and lucky enough, you might, just might, get to untie it. Or you might not, she might say no. But a lot of blokes would mm -hmm. bankrupt themselves, wooing ladies like this, um, and never get to untie that obi. That's um, fascinating. And, so these so these um, courtesans had a choice. They weren't, really, they weren't like, I paid the money, so pay up. You know, absolutely not, no, 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 never, never. Um, the lower, lower ranks, maybe. But these mm -hmm. people, their, where, their chambers were like salons. Mm -hmm. And these, they, were, they, could, they were among the most literate women in society. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were cultured. They wrote poetry, beautiful poetry. They wrote beautifully. Um, they played musical instruments. They sang. They danced. They were entertainers. So they were, it was already to do with showbiz. Um, and they did, let me see, they did the tea ceremony. Um, mm -hmm. They had child trainees with them. Mm -hmm. um, you'd entered this world when you were four and you got trained up. Um, is so that another, gets... Sorry, is that another instance of being born into a, a strata of life or is that? Oh, yes. I mean, you wouldn't be sold to be a courtesan unless you came probably from a quite a impoverished family. Right. Um, so it would mean if you were pretty, um, mm -hmm. You would acquire a skill and you, if you were incredibly lucky, you might rise to be a courtesan. If you okay. weren't so lucky, you might just be a prostitute. Right. But in either case, it happened when you were about four. And in either case, you'd still learn to read and write. You'd learn to dance. So you would have a skill. You'd have a mm -hmm. skill. You'd have a skill, which was which was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry so, to interrupt. Carry on. Oh, go on. So, OK. Mm -hmm. This is another uh, courtesan again. Again, a lady acting the part of a courtesan with the mm -hmm. great headdress. And again, the obi here tied at the front. And she would be offering some sake. She's holding a, a sake dish. Um, and you notice the gorgeous candles mm. and the beautiful sort of old gold background. Um, so to go there was an amazing experience. If, you, you, you could only afford to go there if either you were a literati type or you were a rich man. So those mm. were the, so in these places, merchants who are the bottom of the heap in social terms mm -hmm. could imagine themselves to be nobles and they could imagine that this prostitute mm -hmm. was actually a princess so they could pretend that they were taking part in the tale of genji and they were they'd write poems to each other they could imagine because they couldn't actually rise Excellent. in the social status amazing yeah that makes uh, that's that that makes such sense yes because merchants had the money but they didn't have the status. And yeah, and they were not allowed to display their money either, but they mm. did use some of that money to acquire culture mm -hmm. and also to marry the daughters of poor samurai. Um, uh -huh. Yes, yes, indeed. So this all arose, uh, it was brought about by a lady called Izumono Okuni, and she was a prostitute, and she was living in about 1600 in Kyoto, and um, which was before they all got gathered together. And 
she had this very brilliant idea of performing skits um, on the on the dry riverbed, on a stage in the dry riverbed of the River Carmo in Kyoto. Um, and her most famous skit was when she dressed as a man. She's kind of leaning like a man on this sword here. And there's all sorts of comic figures um, prancing around, music behind. And the, her idea was, if I do this, then after the show, there'll be a whole lot of customers for my favours. And it worked. Um, and so she became incredibly popular. And so soon all the courtesans and prostitutes of Kyoto were all doing wild and crazy dancing. And the word for wild and crazy dancing was kabuku. Wow. And from that came the word kabuki. So at that point, kabuki, this was the origins of kabuki and the origins of geisha. And kabuki and geisha are two sides of the same coin. The geisha do the kabuki dances and um, basically, the, 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 the geisha and the courtesans and the prostitutes were like parlor performers. They, they performed to a private audience, whereas Kabuki is on the public stage. Mm -hmm. And so this went on, I press on, this went on. And around, I think, I forget, in the 17th century, um, gradually the whole focus of life moved to Edo, which we now call Tokyo. And they're the biggest pleasure quarters of the whole lot. Uh, came into existence, it was called the Yoshiwara. And this is a photograph of the Yoshiwara, um, where the women basically lived there. The men came, it was kind of, for the men, it was a sort of fantasy, it was a dream. It was called the floating world. That's what all- Yeah, these I was literally was. about to ask about yeah. the Ukiyo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the floating world is, a, it's a, it, this is a marvelous world, if you're a man. It's a world where you could, once you step inside the Yoshiwara, once you're in there, it's kind of like Disneyland. Once you're there, you can do anything you like and whatever you do will be forgotten the next day. And um, you can go wild, you can have a lot of fun, but it was also a place of great culture. As I said, you could imagine yourself, you know, a great daimyo, you can have women serving you. Um, and the fact you're paying for all this was, you know, it's neither here nor there. Mm -hmm. So, this became, this was the heart of the floating world culture. And as I said, it was, oh, also, Mitford went there quite a few times, Aldrin and Mitford. Indeed, um, yes. Yeah. So I can think that I've, I've read at least two. Sato. Yeah. Yeah, Sato as well. Sato. <laughs> yeah. But he, he, he said it was very decorous. Um, mm. He said it was, and Edward Seidensticker wrote that, uh, that an evening in the Yoshiwara was like an afternoon at tea. Um, yes. But Midford said um, the Yoshiwara was very decorous as compared to Yokohama, the port oh, yeah. town of Yokohama, which he said was nearly as leprous as London's Haymarket. Just goes to show how bad things were in London's Haymarket. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Uh, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Rennie, I think he was. He was an army surgeon or something in from China. And he visited a quarter of Yokohama uh, which he called Gaikuro or something like that. Oh, the Gankuro. The, the, yeah, the Gankuro. No, and, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an inn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And they seem to refer to this as the special, you know, in quotes, pleasure quarters at Yokohama, which was connected by a sort of a bridge uh, <laughs> to the rest of the to the rest of the um, in quotes Japanese uh, town. And he he left a very interesting. Uh, account of that and and the people who worked there who were all licensed by the government essentially to, to uh, fleece foreigners and things like that he said this was a pleasure quarter specifically for foreigners mm -hmm. uh, with very high prices J japanese wouldn't touch a place with foreigners in any way yeah. japanese customers um and there there is a wonderful picture which alas i don't have ready to hand but there is a picture of the gankuro with lots of westerners in their in their underwear doing dances <laughs> with this geisha kind of you know sort of being ever so cloying and sort of coy mm -hmm. and lovely around them um, he, he said there was, was a place in there called the crystal palace which was the favorite place right, that yeah. the foreigners called it <laughs> yeah no no it was a uh, Yes, but also there was a whole pleasure, there was a whole Yoshiwara, a Shin Yoshiwara opened for foreigners to begin with, before the mm. gun, I think. And Westerners wouldn't go there because for some reason they all wanted to go off and meet a nice girl, but they didn't want to walk in publicly. They didn't want to be seen <laughs> into a brothel, um, unlike Japanese who weren't bothered. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean so, that uh, that that strikes me, and it's another it's another road like diverting road. I remember remembering being I remember reading in I think it's Soto, and it could be could be Mitford as well, who talk about being introduced to uh, women at tea rooms, who would essentially become their mistresses or in quotes Japanese wives that they were known as in treaty ports. Yeah, and obviously Sato actually married. Um, a girl, a Japanese girl that he was introduced to through a tea tea house. Mm. But you could go to the local customs guy when you arrived in Nagasaki and mm -hmm. say, um, "I'd like, I'd like a wife." And exactly, wife. that's it. That's yeah. the, that's what they did. Some of them did. But as in Madame Butterfly, that's what Pinkerton mm -hmm. did. Um, and you could have a wife for a year, or a wife for six months, or a wife for you know. But basically, yeah, you, everybody that showed up, all those men, they showed up and, and, and got themselves wives, temporary wives. Fascinating. Um, that was quite uh, normal. So any of their kind of going on about morals was a little bit kind of hypocritical. Well, exactly. And I love the fact, to be honest, that Sato and Mitford don't necessarily preach on that. Although there yeah. was a, the reverend of, was it Shanghai or something like that, who came over was appalled <laughs> by it all. <laughs> there was a there was a high churchman who came over, and I forget what diocese and yeah. he came from, but he he also wrote down that he found rather a lot of um, things that he. <laughs> well, I have to say, it wasn't only Japan. I mean, oh, yes. a, a man could do that all over Asia. I mean, he could probably mm. do it in the West, but he'd have to be more surreptitious. But yeah, <laughs> probably all over Asia. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's fun to be had in the East, which um, it seems that way. Yeah. <laughs> and it was known in to old Japanese hands and stuff like that. This is this is the wisdom they would pass on to newcomers coming in. Go to the go to the customs official. And, so anyway, in, Yoshiwara. In, Yoshiwara. Um, so what Westerners saw, this was the lowest level of prostitute, and they were what it is described by Japanese as being behind a lattice. Westerners saw them as being in cages, but in any case, there they are, and you can pick and choose one. Um, and in uh, because they're low level, you, the woman probably, you know, she has a minder that makes sure that she does go off and provide the necessary service. But the higher you get, the more choosy you can become. And as I said, at the top level, what you're basically running a kind of salon. Um, so if you were a man and you go to the Yoshiwara and you want to woo one of these gorgeous oidan, uh, I I think I have a picture here. Yeah. This is a lady performing the part of an oiran, which is the same as a tayu, a tayu in Kyoto, an oiran in Edo. And again, this, this is the knot of her obi. This, this, this. Wow. Oops, sorry, sorry, I've gone. Yeah, there, that is the knot of her obi. Um, Good grief. <laughs> and so you can tell by the look on her face that if you were to woo her, she would, she would be. She wouldn't be that easy to woo. And what you, you, you'd you have to go and go to her salon. You'd have to um, sit with her and she would maybe deign to serve you a cup of tea. You'd have to have a whole entourage with you, all hired from the Yoshiwara. You have to pay them all. Then they all have to eat. You have to pay for them to eat. Basically, you pay a fortune. That's day one. Day two, you do the same thing again. Day three, you do more of the same. Um, and it goes on. It could go on forever until you are totally bankrupt, in which case you go and kill yourself. Um, which Japanese kind of like this idea of people, people used to say, I think they used to say, um, people in Edo would bankrupt themselves for pleasure. People in Osaka bankrupt themselves for food. That's mm -hmm. very famous. I forget what people in Kyoto bankrupt themselves for, something else. Maybe right. clothes, I think clothes. That people would make sense. Yeah. Clothes. <laughs> uh, but is, is, is the size of the obi relative to the difficulty of untying it by any chance is like <laughs> i don't think so let me show you the next picture this is a real this is a real oil it's not somebody dressed up and okay. with her is her little child assistant mm -hmm. um and you can see again the size of her ob here mm -hmm. um and also you can see that she's wearing clogs mm -hmm. um and this is the same picture you can see these are all her child assistants who will mm -hmm. grow up to become you know, if the, hopefully they'll be oidan, um, but if something were to go badly wrong, they might just end up as prostitutes. Mm -hmm. So they have to play their cards right. But you 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 begin when you're four, um, mm -hmm. and this is a very beautiful 
oidan, usugumo of the Kado Ebiya. And you notice the clog she's standing on. My goodness, yes. Um, and basically she can only walk with her hands on the shoulders of a couple of male attendants. This is her OB here up the front. This is the yeah. um, And there's a particular walk. There's a magnificent film called Sakurambo, um, which is set in the Yoshiwara. And you can see this figure of eight walk. Basically, the Japanese um, eight is written, it's like that. It's sort of like a roof shape. So mm -hmm. it's, so figure of eight doesn't mean an eight of, of our eight. It means that sort of shape. Mm -hmm. um, and you you put one foot forward and you drag it round on the edge of the of the clog, um, and then you step, take the other foot forward. So it's a kind of it's a sort of undulating walk, very very sensory. And they would do they have grand oiran parades. They have them to this day. You can watch them, and they they walk down the main street of the Yoshiwara. Um, and they would do that, and people there'd be crowds and crowds and crowds. They they were basically. To think of them as sex workers is, is wrong. They were like movie stars. To mm -hmm. see one of these women would be like seeing whoever's the great movie star of our day, which I can't quite think who it is. But I mean, it would mm -hmm. be like that. Or, or like seeing Megan or like seeing Princess <laughs> Diana. It would be like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, it would be a big deal to see these people. It would be crowds to see them. Um, well, they are certainly eye catching for a start. I mean, <laughs> just just from now. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is fascinating. Uh, material culture just to visually speaking <laughs> i could go on to talk about geisha or we could leave it at this what do you want to do i i encourage you to give us give us some geisha because i think people are going to be wondering at this point so this is oiran and yeah. and such and okay. you said earlier they're different from geisha so i think i think we owe it to the viewers leslie <laughs> <laughs> okay so what happened? Um, first of all, fix this image in your head. Fix the size of that head, that headdress, and the size of that obi, and the amount of gorgeousness. Get that in your head because you won't see that with geisha. So hopefully we now go on to geisha, and the very first geisha were men. <laughs> um, and this is actually a mate of mine called Shichiko, who is one of the few male geishas still working away. He's made an absolute fortune. Actually, he's doing, he did very well. Um, and went back in, I think it was the 1760s. Basically, before that time, the courtesans were entertainers and also providers of sex, depending, as I said, it not necessarily. But, but it was, I'd say, number one, showbiz, and number two, sex. But around that time, the job of entertainer began to become separate from the job of provider of sex. So then you'd have the courtesan holding court in her chamber, but you'd also have these people who were dancing and singing, playing musical instruments, and they became known as geisha, because geisha, gay is arts and sha is person. So they were arts people. And the very first geisha were men. Um, and they're also called taikomochi. Taikomochi is holder of a drum. Hokan is a jester. They're also called hokan. And then gradually it became more and more women doing the job and less and less men. So Shichiko, actually the number of male geisha in Tokyo at the moment, when I last saw Shichiko, which wasn't that long ago, had increased because people were, people were joining the uh, profession. Um, yeah. But here you've, you've held in your head that all that gorgeousness, this is a geisha. Mm-hmm. So female geisha, number one, the obi is tied at the back. Mm -hmm. And they were forbidden to steal the courtesan's customers. So no sex. Uh in theory, in practice, mm -hmm. who knows? But and also no gorgeous hairstyle, a demure hairstyle, um, not so much fancy makeup, no fancy makeup. And this is actually this is a professional, this is a lady I, I knew called um Kokimi, who was in Shimbashi. And she was a very famous dancer. So they were, they are the dancers. So you go to see the courtesan and there is a performance. Um, and it is these people who do the performance, these people play the music and everything else. Um, and so that is the origins of the geisha. And they, this is a street called, this is Miyagawa Cho in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is it 20 years ago. It looked a bit sort of scruffy. It got fixed up since then. But here are these are mm -hmm. Michael walking down the street. 
So it's an ongoing profession. It's not. It's not. It's not finished. It's it's ongoing, um, as mm -hmm. far as I know. And so, if the, the again, these women, these days, life these days for people who become geisha or anything like that is a bit different than it was in the past. Um, so in the past, you'd get sold by your family because your family was poor and you were good looking. These days, people actually want to be geisha and there are actually TV programs about geisha and people see them. Um, their pe pe people's parents still tend to disapprove. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I knew somebody from Osaka who had run away to be, to be a geisha. But what they are custodians of the traditional Japanese arts. They mm -hmm. practice, you know, J Japanese dance, Japanese theatre. So people want to become geisha because they want to do that. And they also want to look like that. I mean, the mm -hmm. look of the geisha is part of the essence of the geisha's being. It's the look. Mm -hmm. um, so when you start to become a geisha, the first thing is that you, first you get taken on. You have to get taken on by a particular geisha house. It's like when you go to Oxford, you have to get taken on mm -hmm. by a particular college. You don't just go taken on by Oxford. You, so they get taken on by a particular geisha house. Then they are initially, they're in training. They're called a tamago, which is an egg. Uh, tamago means egg. Then they have, then they do shikomi, which means um, learning by watching, which is how you learn everything in Japan. You, you don't have, you don't read a textbook. You, you follow your master and you do what they're doing. So you, you learn and after a year or so, you have mise dashi, which is the sort of like becoming a debutante. It's coming out. Mm -hmm. And you have your face painted up in this way, very fancy headdress put on for this occasion, um, bottom lip only painted red. And you step out in your finery for the first time to make yourself known to the, the geisha mothers of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so that they will send you customers, mm -hmm. because you've got to have customers. And the, one of the key things about this lady's back view is that she has this, this her face is painted white her back is painted white but she has this serpent's tongue of bare mm -hmm. fish at the nape of the neck which is said to be the very sexiest part of the body by mm. japan hence the pl plunging rear <laughs> as well yeah. of the, yeah. <laughs> of it's, the it's, a, it's a decollete at the back exactly not at the front and and here is the obi so it's a big obi but it's at the back not the front. Mm. um i knew this woman actually she's um so she she was the geisha house mother, and mm -hmm. um, so here she is. And I'm I'm going to show you a pair of these clogs in a, in a minute when I finish these pictures. So this is this young girl. Um, and she's going to set off. She's going to walk all around the neighborhood, and she's going to knock on each door, and she's going to say, you know, um, I I I beg your favor. Um, I am a new Michael. Could you please, you know, send me customers? It's a kind mm -hmm. of it's a sort of ritual. Mm -hmm. And she and then she becomes a Michael, mm -hmm. which is and you are a Michael for five years. It's like being an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And you, and this is when you learn your trade. This is Harumi, who I knew quite well, showing off the pillow that she had to sleep on, mm -hmm. uh, which has a sort of wooden base and a padded top. And um, this is not a wig, by the way. This is this is her hair. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the old days, um, this pillow would be put on top of a whole lot of rice bran. So if you, and your head would be oily. So if you, if your head slipped off the pillow when you were asleep, you'd get rice bran in your hair and you'd get beaten. But one of the differences between then and now is that in those days, you began when you were four. Nowadays, you begin when you're 15, once you've finished your education. In those days, you were forced to do it. In these days, you choose to do it. And in those days, you got beaten. In those days you do not these days you do not get beaten because it's a dying profession and people don't want people leaving and you can also leave you can leave you probably wouldn't leave during your five-year training but after that, that that's that that is a moment when you can leave is after your five-year training so this is her and her pillow and this is her you you learn that the shoulder drum you learn the 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 floor drum you learn the shamisen which is this beautiful kind of instrument, um, like a like a like a banjo. Uh, mm -hmm. You learn to sing, you learn to dance. You probably have speciality, and that you will have that your whole life. So you'll be able to teach when you become too old to entertain men anymore. Um, and this is her, not a very good picture, but you can see this is her all painted up. She mm -hmm. spends the daytime in class and the evening entertaining. Um, and there's quite a lot to be said about the about what she learns about. 
how to get on with men. I, th these girls are very composed. I mean, she was 16. She was very mature. Um, and they learn how to how to how to wrap men around their little finger. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if a Westerner goes to a geisha party, I've met Westerners who've been to geisha parties and they would they'd say things to me like, oh, you know, that geisha really fell for me. She really did. Um, and, and I sit there, I think, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, she was a good geisha. She did a fine job. Japanese know perfectly well that when this geisha says to you, oh, oh, God, you're so handsome. You know, yeah. I'm, my knees are weak. Um, they know perfectly well that you say that to absolutely every single man. They know that, but Westerners are a little bit, they're not, little Westerners are a little bit, a little bit more simple. So Westerners don't necessarily get it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's also another example of the geisha way of getting on with men is um, the golf geisha. <laughs> right. I knew a golf geisha in, in Shimbashi in Tokyo. Um, and the key thing is you go off to play golf. You wear, of course, you wear the proper golf kit. People wouldn't know you're a geisha except for your hair. They probably know. Um, and you go and play with some top, top businessman. And the key thing is um, you play, you play very well. You play damn well because he's not going to feel good if you're rubbish. Right. Mm -hmm. So you play very well. But then somehow he wins. Uh -huh. So he feels really good about himself because you were so good. But mm -hmm. he won. So. It's, it's actually these are quite useful lessons in everyday life for Western women too. I think. Yeah, for exactly. Women, that that golf like, that yeah. golf geisha scenario is is encapsulates a lot of uh, a lesson in itself. Uh, as yeah. re referencing even back to the the flattery of customers and uh, making them feel like they're the only person in the world, even yeah. though this is literally their job. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot. I mean, yeah, but it's, it's. I mean, I think it's myself. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good way. It's helpful for women. Brilliant. Anyway, you learn I mean, I'm a West, I'm a Western man, so yeah. I can't comment. But I will. Yeah. I'll get on board with what you're talking about, Leslie. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you're with a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look out for it. <laughs> so this is, um, this is a Michael, which means a dancing girl. That's she's, she's a trainee. Um, and then you have a whole graduation ceremony called Erikai, which is the changing of the collar. And then you dress like this. Um, and now she's wearing a wig. So that means that she can take it off and she has short hair and she can take off the whole outfit and you wouldn't know she was a geisha. Mm -hmm. um, and also she doesn't wear, the, she has low clogs. She ha doesn't have long sleeves anymore. She has short sleeves. She doesn't have a huge obi anymore. She has a smaller obi. She probably dressed much more demurely in black. So these are professionals, if you like. And so this is, she's a, in, in Kyoto, they're called geiko. Um, yeah. And in the rest of the country, they're called geisha. Because um, in Kyoto, you just do things differently. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the Kyoto, people of Kyoto think they're that little bit better than. No, so, yes, exactly. It must be that they were around. Everybody does everything wrong outside of Kyoto. <laughs> That's the last of my pictures. So I'll see if I can come back to you. Mm -hmm. So I could just show you this pair of clogs, wouldn't I just show you? Yes, please, yes. That was a, that was a wonderful gallery you just gave us there. That was a real treat. <laughs> so these are geisha clogs. Oh, oh. yes, these are micro clogs. See, wow. Quite, quite, yes. difficult walk on, mm. quite difficult to walk on. Um, but I mean, it's a bit like it's a bit like women wearing stilettos. Being difficult to walk is irrelevant. I mean, you oh, want gosh. to wear them. You want to wear them. Um, yeah. What, so, why the do you do you know is is it is it to what was it what were they were they developed in that way to for walking out obviously because you don't wear shoes indoors of any kind um but is it to keep mud off you and things like that is that it well these are higher but they as you saw with the with the quarter also they're way yeah. higher. i mean there are lots of wooden clogs in japan called geta mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which are to keep you sort of off the off the wet soil but these, why these are this high? I think it's also because, I think one reason is because the micro would have been children. Uh -huh. They would have been children. Nowadays, they're not. Nowadays, as I said, they begin at 15, but they would have been little. So to raise them up to the same height as the customers. Oh, if, right. If they're, imagine if they're eight or nine, you know, mm -hmm. that would make them taller. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. But that, yes, excellent props. You know, you have he brought props as well. That's that's brilliant. People love to see these sorts of things as well. This is, this is the book I wrote about it, mm -hmm. um, about geisha. Yes. With, with lots of pictures in there. Lots of mm -hmm. pictures. Some pictures. Um, some of the pictures I showed you. 
lots of pictures. Yeah. Um, oh, and I also wrote this book, Madame Sadiaco, which well, is about yes. um, a geisha who became the model for Puccini's Man and Butterfly. And you can see how beautiful she was. I'll just bring it closer. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, I have this book. It's 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 really good. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was I'm very keen on this book. I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I know I'm keen on the research I did. It was very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, we all have our favourites of our books, really. <laughs> and this is my most recent one, which is The Shogun's Queen, which is about life in the women's palace, which we've also... Indeed, uh, indeed. And this is, is this the, this is about the, the, the last Shogun, or the one before the last Shogun? The Shogun's, it's the, he was two before the last Shogun. Yes. He was the, the hang on, he was the 13th Shogun, then there's the 14th Shogun. And the last was the 15th. Okay. So he's the 13th mm -hmm. in this particular story, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a true story. This is yes. the story, again, of a woman who wielded power. Indeed. Uh, for, she was from, is she one of the ones from Satsuma or is she, was she from Mito? I, I, I remember, I remember stories of a couple. <laughs> she was from Satsuma. Uh -huh. She was from Satsuma in the days when, she, when Shimazu Nariakira, who was mm -hmm. a fantastic daimyo, Mm -hmm. um, was trying to make things work mm -hmm. and this particular shogun had some problems he was rather weak uh, and he also had no children mm -hmm. and Shimaza wanted very much to um, persuade him to to take the guy who finally became the last shogun as his heir because this guy was extremely competent Yoshinobu was mm -hmm. a competent brilliant you know noble guy in fact Sato Met him, all of them. Sato met, yeah. met Yoshinobu, and they were. They all said, "What a, what a noble figure he was." Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, if you if you're looking for some good historical <laughs> fiction, then this the people who write about this period uh, have chosen well, and Leslie has Leslie has the novels for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, one of the books I most enjoyed reading about um, was Women of the Mito Domain. And um, I loved the little daily life bits uh, that were included in that uh, about, you know, the times you would go to school, uh, mm -hmm. set out to go to school and the like, how you could tell a woman's status by how her hair was done. And um, the uh, lovely little moments of a family sort of affection. Uh, a devoted wife, uh, the author remembered, mm -hmm. getting up every day and doing her husband's hair, even though he was pretty much bald by mm -hmm. the end of his life. And she was yes. basically just combing small little <laughs> yeah. uh, strands across his head because that was the daily uh, bit, little affectionate thing she did for him. And uh, that is a book I, I recommend to everybody to read as well. Leslie didn't write it, but it's one of my favourites. <laughs> yeah, I love that book. It's very good. It's quite a long time since I read it. But I remember, for some reason, I remember very strongly a part where they write about a man who married this incredibly beautiful girl, and then he went blind. And so for mm. the rest of his life, he didn't know. He always thought he was, he pictured the same beautiful, beautiful girl that he'd married, little knowing that actually she'd become, you know, she'd become old, I suppose. Mm. Um, yeah, and that, I think I that, remember that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, and also that they all learned, they all learned sewing, they mm -hmm. were seamstresses. Um, if you go to, um, um, where was it? If you go to Mito, I think, you can, you can go to the school there. Um, now, what do I think? Um, no, it, Isa, Isa, there's a school mm -hmm. there. And you can see what the classroom was like, where people learned. The book itself yeah. is, is very rich and very enjoyable. And if you're interested in, any of the things we've talked about today, along with Leslie's books, <laughs> by all means, support support Leslie here. Um, that should be on your list as well. So, um, well, that was a fascinating presentation, Leslie. Lovely to talk to you about all these things. Um, I hope that those who have uh, tuned in to watch are as inspired as I am right now to, to dig back into all these books and uh, I hope as well that they will buy your books. <laughs> um, and so with that, ladies and gentlemen, if you like the video, do do please like and subscribe, share around, you know, tell people to come here and do the same. It's 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 YouTube. It's, it's polite. <laughs> 
it's the right thing to do. And uh, leave a comment below if you have any questions. Uh, if uh, you have any questions directly for Leslie, with your permission, I'll pass them on to you and I'll alert you to their presence there and maybe and we'll get an answer for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and apart from that, again, thank you so much for watching. I do honestly appreciate all of the support people give the channel. And with that, I, I will see you in the next video. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody who has showed up. Uh, yeah, via con Dios. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Josh. And thank, thank you very much, everybody, for watching.